There we go, and it's 10.30, so we'll go ahead and start. we got 16 people so far, and we will mm. let anybody else come in. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You are all good. We are good, and we're glad to have Ron today talking about air pollution. Mm. So we will no, clean or dirty our air is today. Any news before we start? You know, speaking of lungs and having clean lungs, our one of our receptionists at church, Sue Quirk, was just in the hospital Ooh. a couple days ago with uh, blood clots in the lungs. She Ooh. had three blood clots that went from her legs to her lungs. But um, emailed me today and said she's back home and doing fine on medicine. So mm. let's keep her in prayers. And evidently, Heather Shoup's, um, um, what do you call it, biopsy came back negative, so she's good. Uh, for a uh, breast tumor. For yeah. Breast tumor. Right. yeah. Where is she, Alice, now? I Last I heard, she was living with her sister in our bed. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, my only other piece of news is about Zoom. Uh, Zoom did email, um, I think everybody uh, that's on it, and said you must update to the new software 5.0 uh, by next Sunday or uh, it will not work for you. Okay. So if you're maybe go into your settings on Zoom if you have a Zoom account and uh, make sure it's at 5.0 or higher. And in fact, if you've got on the last month or so, you should be. But uh, I will send out a little more information on that. I don't think it's going to be a big deal, but just in case, that may be if ca case you can't get on uh, a week or so from now, that could be the problem because they're doing security fixes and they want you to have the latest software. I can't. I have to get up. Okay. Nice to have everybody here. Ron, tell us about air pollution. <laughs> okay. Can we get uh, everybody to mute first? Yes, if everybody would mute yourself, or, yeah. and I will also have the ability to go in and mute anybody that we hear too. So there's no background noise. And Ron, do you want to take questions during your presentation? Yeah, or? I'll try to stop and uh, every couple slides and see if we can get, take any questions. Okay, sounds good. Alrighty. Okay, as we talk about air pollution today, what you see is a picture of Denver and on one of our terrible days. We've got a propensity for uh, thermal inversions, which traps the polluted uh, air down at Denver. We, of course, right now, as you heard in the sermon, are getting uh, much, much better air quality uh, numbers. 30% improvement or better. In fact, it's happening all over the country pretty much. And it's because we're not driving. We've shut down a lot of uh, uh, large factories and stuff. So our air quality is noticeably improved. But it's something that's important to all our lives and uh, certainly something that plays on your health. I want to mention the scope of today's uh, talk. We're going to talk about the, the key pollutants that you breathe. Now, there's other things that get dumped into the air that affect uh, global warming. We're not gonna talk uh, the global warming things today. Just concentrate on the things that are really bad for your breathing, your, your asthma, your stuff like that. Okay. How many saw the uh, Ken Burns documentary on the Dust Bowl? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, that was good. Okay. It certainly uh, highlighted the harm that can be done to the lungs by particular, particulate matter, dust, things like that. Uh, generally, when we think of the contaminants in the air, there's the aerosols. Those are liquid and solid particles. And we usually measure those in micrograms per cubic centimeters. And then there's the vapors or the gases. And we measure those in parts per million. You've probably heard that the uh, CO2 concentration has gone above 400 parts per million. That, of course, is a 
uh, a greenhouse gas. And of course, there's a lot of pollutants that cannot be detected by the human senses. We can certainly smell things like uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, but we can't smell a lot of harmful uh, gases that can frankly kill us. And the UN Environmental uh, Group estimates that uh, about 5% of the global diseases are caused by uh, air pollution. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's happening is uh, ambassadors and US people are getting sent to embassies all around the world. Uh, they've put air pollution monitoring equipment on just about all the embassies all around the world. And they've found that some of the embassies are in extremely dangerous areas like Delhi, India, which has horrific air pollution. And they tell people before they even think of assigning them there, this is an assignment into a dangerous area, not from a standpoint of muggers or civil war, but just the air is so bad, you're definitely going to be hurting your health just by being assigned there. <clears throat> so uh, air pollution has surpassed poor sanitation and dirty water. It's the number one cause of premature deaths in the world. And almost half of Americans live in counties with high levels of ozone or particle pollution. And uh, we in Denver are having trouble with ozone and particle pollution. Okay, uh, what we see on this screen are the six biggies. These are the ones that are <laughs> looked at most carefully by uh, the air pollution people. Top one, particulate matter. We'll hear it known as PM. We'll hear the numbers PM10, PM2.5, and that means we'll, there's a later slide where we'll go into a little more detail on particular matter. Uh, but it, the PM2.5 is a finer filter, and that means smaller particles. The bigger the number, the bigger the particles. The smaller the number, the smaller the particular amount. Ozone, which is O3, it's three oxygen models. have uh, carbon monoxide detectors to protect us in our house. Sulfur dioxide uh, forms uh, sulfuric acid and it's, it's bad for us. It is largely uh, put in the air by coal-fired power plants and they are starting to cut back and so the sulfur dioxide numbers are going down. Uh, you, you'll hear of nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide. Those are Bad for us. And then, of course, lead. Nobody wants lead in their blood. Uh, let's look at particular matter, which we call PM. And a PM10 particle is any particle 10 micrometers or below. It's a tenth of the width of a human hair, very tiny. <clears throat> Although you can see it is if there's a whole bunch of PM10 particles in the air, smoke or haze. Uh, certainly, forest fires create a lot of particular matter, particulate matter. And the forest fires we've had in the last couple summers in Western United States have been very bad for creating particular matter, particulate matter. PM 2.5, these are particles less than 2.5 micrometers. And they're particularly dangerous. They're worse than the larger particles because they can pass directly through the walls of your lungs and get into the bloodstream and cause cardiovascular system things, heart attacks, strokes, and uh, different areas of the country and different nations have different PM limits. The US has a limit of um, particular matter PM 2.5 as, as uh, 65 micrograms per, per 
per cubic meter. The World Health Organization uh, has a much lower limit, and the European Union also has a lower limit. And then even <laughs> below 2.5, there's something they call nanoparticles. And uh, interesting, PM 2.5 causes twice as many deaths per year as auto accidents. We have a little picture on this slide showing the Suncor refinery there in Commerce City. How many here have uh, driven up uh, I-25 and really smelled the sulfur dioxide in the air near the Suncor refinery, or even seen the cloud coming away from that refinery? Anybody out there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. In addition to the big six, uh, I put a, one of the most horrible air pollution events ever to occur. Uh, it was a, a, a release that occurred in Bhopal, India, the night of December 2nd, 1984, and it has killed 25,000 people. 27 tons of methyl iocyanide pesticide was released. It was a Union Carbide facility. Uh, that had 40 tons of this stuff stored, and they basically sort of semi-deconditioned the plant, shut it down somewhat, and they took away almost all the uh, safety precautions they had to deal with a release from that plant. They had a horrible release of the methyl, methyl cyanide, the <coughs> pesticide, and it killed, again, 25,000 people in one most of them in one night, but there's still people dying of it. And 150,000 people uh, were affected. Uh, the reason I remember it so well is I worked at that time for the Union Carbide Nuclear Division. Our division had nothing to do with the, uh, the parent company's uh, facility there in Bhopal, India. But it certainly was a uh, horrific thing. Uh, and the government of India tried to uh, get somebody at Union Carbide and uh, legally nail them. In fact, they tried to get the CEO of Union Carbide and bring him to India to try him for this horrible uh, thing that happened that night. One of the worst incidences in the United States, this is not a pesticide, but in Denora, Pennsylvania, which is in Eastern Pennsylvania, 1948 in the fall, Small town, population 14,000, and there was a zinc uh, production plant there. I think there was also a steel plant, maybe another one. But there was a temperature inversion, and the pollution built up so badly. It was carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and metal dust. And it ended up killing 20 people in just a couple days and giving at least half the town severe respiratory. Problems. It was a stinging yellow smoke coming from the steel and the zinc plant. They had to cancel a high school football game uh, because as the quarterback went back to pass and looked downfield, uh, the, there was so much sulfur dioxide and mist in the air, he couldn't see the end, the tight ends, to, oh to throw a pass more than 10 yards. So. <laughs> and interestingly enough, the zinc plant was so adamant about continuing production, they wouldn't even shut down during this uh, event. Then here's the event that really led to the uh, environmental laws being passed in England. London, England, December 1952. There was a TV documentary on uh, Winston Churchill uh, at this time, but there was a horrific temperature inversion in London and uh, they said at one theater, they called it the Sadler's Wells Theater, performance was stopped when the audience could no longer see the stage. <laughs> there were some places they said where the visibility went down to like 20 feet or something. And it really led to the first passage of a Clean Air Act in the United Kingdom in 1956. But again, the smog level was 56 times normal and no less than 12,000 Londoners uh, choked to death on that horrific uh, air at that time. So this, this, this event right here was probably the father 
of Clean Air Acts. Okay, any questions uh, so far? Does anyone remember that Bhopal, India event? I think I remember that, Ron, and as well as others in India, you hear about things like that, it seems regularly in India. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was little, my family lived in West Virginia and, you know, he's talking about the smell and the smog and stuff. The plant we lived close to was Union Carbine. And in the morning there would be stuff on the front porch and you know, you're talking about the smell and the color of the air. You know, thinking about it, I don't know what that was, but even as a little kid, I knew it was yucky. <laughs> <laughs> so that was West Virginia there in um, South Charleston, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, still, when you drive through Greeley, you smell the cow manure, don't you, from the yeah. plant there? It, does that air pollution, Ron, that's dangerous? Uh, I'd have to look. I think it's certainly a volatile organic compound, which we're going to talk about in a few, a few slides on. Just about anything that smells is a VOC, a volatile organic compound. The manure is... Uh, Ron, uh, Gene Dawson, and Mary and I lived for a number of years in Greeley uh, uh, when the uh, heat packing uh, uh, Montford was very close to town. They've moved it out since. But isn't methane gas one of the high pollutants that's uh, also contributing to our problem of air quality? Yeah, methane is, is probably the worst uh, gas from the perspective of global warming. It's like 40 times worse than uh, carbon dioxide and its contribution to global warming. Hey, while we were mentioning that, you know, it's been reported that cow flatulence is a big contributor to, is it global warming? Is that true? And is that really air pollution? It's very true. And it's certainly hurting. Uh, hurting. It's, it, it's doing a lot of things. We ought to be giving our cows a, uh, Gas X or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Telling them not to burp so much, too. <laughs> Up feeding them beans, huh? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, if you read the papers, you're going to hear about uh, living in an either an attainment or non attainment area relative to uh, air pollution. And the federal governments uh, and the state is is come cracking down on Colorado telling us we've got to do more to attack our ozone and particular matter particulate matter uh, violations they've been hovering very high for a long time now we've taken some action but it's not bringing the numbers down uh, like uh, we want them to and so they are trying to look at ways to drive uh, the numbers down for ozone and PM25, PM10, and get our uh, more parts of our state into an attainment status instead of a non-attainment status. Uh, air pollution standards, there's the primary standards to protect health, secondary standards to protect the environment and property. There's a picture down here of, uh, for those that remember the movie Three Coins in the Fountain, there was a song Roman. from the movie. Uh, Roman Audrey Hepburn was it? Was that it? No. What, at any rate, but there was the song Three Coins in the Fountain," and uh, a lot of the statues in the areas uh, of Italy and certainly our country are being dissolved by sulfuric acid and other air pollutants that, that have reacted and formed acids. So about 90 million Americans, that's almost a third of the country, live in a non-attainment area. All right. When we talk about pollutants, both the time and concentration is important. Uh, short exposures to some bad air, if you walk past a bonfire, uh, that's a short exposure. 
it's long-term exposures that, that do more harm. So you've got to look at both the concentration level of the pollutant and how long you're exposed. And I jokingly say, it's also true for other things like x-rays, flu viruses, oh, and uh, air pollutants. How many, how many recognize the face of the guy on this uh, slide? Can you name the, the movie? Oh. Uh, Christmas Vacation, and that's Cousin Eddie. <laughs> Cousin Eddie. Yeah, and of course, the, the longer Cousin Eddie stayed, if you ever watched that movie, the more ir irritating he got. There's the old saying, uh, guests think after three days or something, like fish or something. Yeah. Yeah, and, and same thing with x-rays. Uh, uh, x-ray exposures, the longer and the more x-rays you have, the, uh, the greater the danger. And they've gone a long way in x-rays now to get the exposure levels down to shorter periods of time and less intensity of x-rays. But certainly the time and concentration is important for air pollutants and important for the coronavirus. That's why if uh, two of us are riding our bicycles at 30, uh, 30 miles an hour and whiz past each other, the chances of getting coronavirus passed is almost zilch. But if we sit together in a small booth and talk with each other, uh, the, the risk goes way up. Okay, another thing you got to consider uh, with pollutants is your proximity to highways. Um, they're starting to find that you don't really want to live real close to a busy highway. <laughs> if your bedroom window is open and there's an I-25 quarter uh, very, very close to your house, that's not good. Uh, they, they've looked at the studies and they found that within two-tenths to three-tenths of a mile of a major highway, you're definitely getting more pollution. So if you go to buy a house, you're better off if you can put some distance between your house and a major highway. Of course, a major highway would not only be an expressway, but it could be something like Colfax Avenue or Rapaho Road, other highways that get uh, Broadway, University that get a, a lot of uh, traffic. I know because I live, my bedroom and my bed was no more than 12 feet from the curb of uh, the street. Fortunately, it wasn't a heavily traveled street or highway, but I'm sure it wasn't good for me growing up so close, my bed being so close to the, uh, the road. <laughs> so, that, Al, so that explains some things. <laughs> uh, it's also really bad if you pull up, if you're caught in a traffic jam, and also if all of us have had that experience. And if you pull up, the closer you pull up to the car in front of you, the worse it is. And it's particularly bad if you pull up real close to a puffer that's really throwing out the stuff and sit in a traffic jam for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Not good, not good at all. We found that the ultrafine particles, the carbon monoxide, the NOxs, the black carbon. Yes, I noticed that. All that stuff uh, goes up. Comments <clears throat> on these uh, facts? Okay. We also want to talk about nanoparticles. And again, these are particles even smaller than the PM 2.5s. And uh, it really comes down to surface area. A fat particle, like a football, has a good bit of surface area. But if you break the football into a bunch of golf ball sized particles, you get a lot more surface area. And it's extra surface area. It's, wor it's better to have a football particle with its surface area than to break the football into a whole bunch of golf ball sized particles and breathe them. So the small particles are worse, and the studies are showing, just in the last decade, we're producing more of those really small particles than we thought we were, and it's getting worse. Uh, again, uh, the first bullet on this slide says that the, 
Uh, this again shows the danger of being real close to, the, to a busy street. The particle panel drops by about 40% as you move 33 feet back from the curb. So again, if you can avoid sleeping on the curb uh, of Colfax Avenue, you're going to do a whole lot better. Uh, the nanoparticles, that's PM 0 0.3 and smaller, account for over 90% of all the particles. And uh, also, uh, a study in Ohio in 2017 found that uh, living in a high PM 2.5 area a month prior to conception increase your chances of uh, having a child with birth defects. Uh, air pollution is also decreasing fertility in men. Uh, the sperm counts are dropping off uh, from generation to generation as we look at men living in uh, high pollution areas. So I guess we could push the numbers so high that it turns into a good birth control, huh? <laughs> Okay, you've probably heard the word air quality index, AQI. <laughs> and AQI is a composite number uh, formed by looking at the basic uh, five or six uh, pollutant uh, things. And you want to be, you want a low AQI. You want, the, you want a high IQ and you want a low AQI. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you want to try to be below 50 in your AQI. I looked at Denver this morning and we're below 50. That's good. Um, but you see the scale going up uh, to as high as 500 and up. And Denver has had last year, in the last two years, a lot of days where the uh, AQI numbers pushed up even above 200. We've gotten into the very unhealthy scale. Ron, where can you uh, check on that? Air okay, quality? I'm going to show you a slide uh, where you can uh, look at this number every day real time and get numbers from all over uh, the Denver area and all over the country. So it's coming up here. Let's get to it. It's, the, it's okay, we'll, we'll go back. We'll get to it. Okay, so looking at the six categories of the API, you can't read this. You can, you can go online, by the way, to... Uh, uh, web, what's the uh, web encyclopedia, Wikipedia, and look up AQI and it'll get, get you all the, day, the data. Uh, but the key things that go into the AQI are ozone measurements for one hour and eight hours, particular, particulate matter PM 2.5 and 10 for 24 hours, and it also includes sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen dioxide. So go to Wikipedia if you want to look at that AQI and get the technical detail. But to actually see it, uh, I encourage everybody to write this down. Just go to airnow.gov and put in your zip code. And if you see the screen here, uh, I snapped this uh, just a few days ago, data updated May 15th. I looked at this morning's data, it looked pretty good. But I looked at ozone and PM, particulate matter. And uh, the numbers really looked nice that day. Of course, uh, they're enhanced by the, uh, the shutdown we've had and we're getting some great numbers. So I encourage everybody to write this down, airnow.gov and uh, put in your zip code or the zip code of your loved one back east or wherever they live, and you can, you can see how the uh, air is for the day. Uh, back up now on the slide. Here are uh, some of the major and most important uh, air indicators. We see across the top carbon monoxide, that's CO for those of your chemistry majors, NH3, which is ammonia, NOx, which is uh, either, it's a combination of nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide. You see the particular particulate matter, yeah. the PM25 and the PM10, the sulfur dioxide, and 
the volatile organic compounds. If you want to impress your neighbors, <coughs> talk about the VOCs. But uh, I, I put a code down there on the bottom, uh, what the colors are, the blue, orange, green, and purple. We'll look real quick. The blue color is stationary fuel combustion. That means like a coal-fired power plant or a, uh, anything where you set up something and you're burning something uh, in a non-moving or flying vehicle. Mm. And we can see what, what the blue smacks the heart of. <laughs> blue clobbers the uh, sulfur uh, dioxide. It's the dominant sulfur dioxide uh, contaminant. And it does a pretty good number on the particulate matter too. PM25 and the PM2, the PM10, we can see, are heavily influenced by uh, stationary fuel combustion. Let's jump to the next color, the orange. These are industrial and other processes. These are like a, a, a cement plant, uh, maybe an assembly plant where you're kicking up uh, dust or you've got furnaces burning even in uh, baking bread or something. And uh, certainly it's mining activities. Uh, you see the, the orange is uh, a major contributor to carbon monoxide. Uh, look how much ammonia comes from uh, uh, these, these processes. It's the dominant. And volatile organic compounds. Uh. Uh, green is the highway vehicles. We can see where the green is uh, hitting, hits us real hard on carbon uh, monoxide uh, and NOx, nitrogen oxides. And the purple is non-road mobile. That means uh, airplanes, trains, boats, and ships. All right. Denver. Unfortunately, Denver's known for being one of the cleanest and greenest cities, and we do pretty well in a lot of areas, but we're in the worst 10 in terms of uh, hazardous air pollution. What's killing us, again, is the ozone and the particulate matter. Uh, we had over 260 days where we exceeded the level uh, in the last two years. To no surprise, the more pre-health hazards you have, like asthma, or being a child, or being elderly, uh, you're more affected by the uh, air pollution. Okay, any comments, any uh, questions at this point? Ron. Yeah. Um, when they say on television, in the media, that today's a bad, air pollution day for Denver. Are they talking about downtown? Would it be different for those of us that are farther from downtown? Uh, the answer is a definite yes. It is worse uh, downtown. I know when I came to Denver in 1985, uh, Martin Marietta had us look at a slideshow for a bunch of us coming from Oak Ridge, Tennessee that intended to buy houses here. And they showed us a pollution map. And you could see where the Commerce City area was especially bad, and the areas just uh, eastward of uh, Commerce City were especially bad. So it does vary from area to area. And if you go to that airnow.gov site, you can click on specific measuring points and your particular zip code, and even particular measuring stations and get the reading for the day, the day uh, at those measuring stations. Steve, I would say you and Vicki are in one of the, the better areas relative to Metro Denver. You're not quite as good as being out in the total boonies, but you're much better off than had you picked uh, to live in downtown Denver. They've also found in downtown Denver, if you get into uh, one of the high rise uh, tower areas, the high-rise towers actually form like tunnels where they trap air in channels or caves and the pollution levels can really get high uh, 
in areas of downtown Denver that are surrounded by super tall buildings uh, with a heavy traffic load going through them. Ron, Ron Dean Dawson, I used to work at the Metro State and of course the Denver Basin is notorious for uh, high pollution counts, but it travels up the South Platte, therefore moving <laughs> up along the front range, but certainly up that river. Uh, uh, Highland Ranch did not have that good a record uh, years back uh, however, and uh, so I don't think uh, we all should have too much comfort as to what part of the metro area we live in. Yeah. Some are more acute than others, you're quite right. Okay, we're going to look at a map uh, showing the ozone uh, pollution area. Ron, right. this is yeah, Linda. Um, is the AQI, is that an average of all of those different? Yes, it's a composite on? number of uh, that looks at uh, at least six of those things. However, the AQI is calculated to take into account uh, if one of the numbers is really high. In other words, uh, if the ozone is really bad, the AQI is gonna go high. It's not gonna be averaged out and dropped because the other pollutants are low that day, which is a fair thing. Because your body is gonna get clobbered by the, the worst one it's not gonna uh, be compensated for by the other bad guys being uh, uh, low that day. So it does take the worst, kind of the worst of the six and largely bases the number on the worst of the six. Okay, thank Would it you. Correct to assume that uh, uh, Wyoming has the cleanest air? Did you say who, Iowa? <laughs> Wyoming. Wyoming. Uh, Yes and no. Uh, there's uh, a lot of coal mining going on and Wyoming has uh, one of the highest percentages of coal-fired power plants. And they also have huge gas fields like the Jonas gas field. Uh, in general, Wyoming does pretty good, but if you're near one of those coal-fired power plants or some of the heavy mining areas, it, it may not be so good. Ron, this is Jane Watson. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, about the Suncorp. Uh, it seems to me that I've been reading in the newspapers uh, more recently about how they've tried to get them to uh, reduce the pollution, but it doesn't seem to be, according to what you've said, uh, it doesn't seem to be working because uh, I've been in that area and it is bad. Yes, uh, they've had several violations. It looks like from, from an engineering critique standpoint, their process systems are not very fault tolerant. That means when they're working well and the components are all in order, uh, they get very good numbers. But they seem to be prone to having uh, equipment failures or leaks or things along that line occasionally. And when those leaks happen, it looks like the system numbers just go through the roof in terms of producing uh, bad numbers. Those systems are also very vulnerable and very sloppy during startup. A lot of those big chemical processes have to be started up and built up to their steady state operational level. And while you're taking them up to the operating level, uh, they often severely violate uh, their design point, uh, particularly uh, and other pollutant levels as they're coming up to the design point and the operating levels. Uh, it doesn't seem that we can control those things very easily then, you know, all that terrible pollution. There, those processes, those big chemical processes, a lot of them are vulnerable to equipment failures. We had a catalytic uh, uh -huh. converter, <laughs> some equipment coming up, and they, it seems like they get some equipment failures. Ron, this is Chris. Uh, two comments. One, 10 years ago, the lowest air pollution measurable was in, believe it or not, Los Alamos and Taos. 
and it had to do with the fact that there are no producers close by in the wind currents they have. Okay. And with regard to being able to slow it down, I'm sure that a lot of us 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, flew into Los Angeles and it was had a big orange ball around it. It's gone and it's mainly attributable to carb. Okay. So it's, it can be fixed. Yeah. You have We're going to look at some numbers in a few minutes here. Uh, I mentioned volatile organic compounds. You've probably seen how on uh, gas pumps, there's a little rubber sponge near the uh, insert point. It kind of forms a lip around the uh, fuel system. And that's, that's uh, put on there to try to keep some of the evaporating gasoline from any, entering the air. Those are known as VOCs, gasoline, uh, evaporates very quickly and puts uh, VOCs into the air. And virtually any hydrocarbon left out will evaporate mm. quickly. Kerosene, paint thinner, mm. paints, uh, formaldehyde, glues, mothballs, almost any odor odorous liquid. Even perfume is a, a VOC, although not a very dangerous one. <laughs> uh, there's also, you'll hear some, something called PAHs, which are polycyclic aromatic compounds. And uh, they're mm -hmm. formed from burning <laughs> agricultural residue. I noticed as we crossed the bridge into Missouri, uh, where the Ohio River meets the Mississippi River, there were some huge agricultural burns going on in Missouri right there. I couldn't believe the size of the uh, smoke clouds coming up from some of the burning fields. And those fires were, I'm sure, pouring phenomenal quantities of VOCs into the air. Okay. Ozone, the O3. Uh, if you look, at, if you, you can kind of think of the atmosphere as a continual uh, combustion process at low temperature or a continual boiling pot of, of uh, gases. And they've found to model the atmosphere chemistry, there's over 500 chemical reactions going on. And uh, they have found, they certainly found in the, in the 40s and 50s that sunlight was a major driver of a lot of those uh, chemical reactions. So one of the bad things is they have VOCs in the air like evaporated gasoline, and then to add to it nitrogen oxides, the NOxes, mm. and add sunlight. It looks like when you add these three together, you generate a lot of ozone. Uh, interestingly enough, forests produce volatile organic compounds. You say, gee, I thought trees were good for us. And the, the, uh, the VOCs, these are, uh, okay when the forest produces them if there's not nitrogen oxides around in, in the case of the smoky mountains or at least the unoccupied area of the smoky mountains uh, they're producing a lot of vocs but unless you drive cars through the forest uh, the nox isn't there mm. so the vocs tend to go into the upper atmosphere but uh but definitely forests are a source of uh, vocs uh, we have to, we're going to talk a little bit about diesels. Diesels, of course, get very high fuel efficiency. It's because they run very high temperatures and pressures. A diesel engine compresses the air more so than a gasoline engine and burns the fuel at a higher temperature and pressure, giving you better fuel economy, better efficiency, but it also produces a lot more nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, ozone. Uh, ozone is uh, both good and bad. We want ozone in the upper atmosphere. We want good quantities of it. Uh, it protects us from uh, solar rays from outer space. Uh, this shows the size of the ozone hole uh, for several of the last few years. And we had a real low 
uh, ozone hole size. Uh, that's the absence. The ozone hole means an absence of ozone in the upper atmosphere in a given area. And generally, uh, we've made some substantial improvements in decreasing the size of the upper atmosphere ozone hole. But the ozone's bad at ground level, very bad. So you want ozone low uh, at ground level, but you want healthy levels of ozone high up. You so don't want it at ground level. You don't want it at ground level. You do want it high up. Okay, getting back to diesels. Uh, 40 years ago, we thought diesels were great. Uh, we thought, gee, you know, they, they're more efficient. And they're putting out this sooty stuff, but it's big, fat, uh, city particles that settle real quickly. Well, research has shown they're not so good. Yes, they do put out large soot particles, but they also put out tremendous quantities of small PM particles. And they're a whole lot worse than anybody thought they were uh, compared to 50 years ago. Interestingly enough, there's a show on TV. I don't watch it, but it's called The Diesel Brothers. And uh, the guys that do, were doing this uh, show were showing people uh, how to uh, beat the diesel engine uh, uh, pollution controls to get more smoke and efficiency from the diesels. And they have been slapped with a lawsuit for almost a million dollars for having committed over 400 Cleaner Act violations which have included installing and selling devices to defeat emission controls on particularly trucks. And there's a couple pictures of uh, uh, diesel uh, trucks putting phenomenal quantities of visible PM particles out. So Ron, they, uh, as a, they're spot for the fine. And they're still on TV for this uh, upcoming season, I believe. There was just an article in National Geographic about that very fact, and they also have uh, controls that, I, and I don't know whether they came from this show or not, that allow the extra emission by a switch inside the truck, so that if you're driving by a Prius, you can tell them what you think about their environmental controls. Mm. It's called rolling dust. Whew. Or rolling coal, excuse me, rolling coal. Mm. Hmm. So unfortunately, it looks like a lot of men in this country think you're a, you're a real he-man if you can throw big quantities of uh, smoke out of your diesel. Sad commentary. We also know wood fires are a strong PM source. And I wish we would phase out or almost even ban fireplaces. They're, they're bad news. Again, getting up, to looking at the diesel. How many remember the uh, Volkswagen scandal of uh, just five years ago? Yeah. Uh, they uh, they actually planned planted the uh, software in their uh, diesel engine controls to detect if it was being put in test mode to test it and they would change the operating point of the diesel to give good results if it was being tested. But it went, when it back, went back to uh, general street use uh, operation, it would detect that and go back to its dirty and polluting uh, uh, operating point. Uh, generally, uh, noted, note the second bullet on here. Even the most efficient diesel car puts out three times more NOx and 10 times more particulate matter, PM, than a gas engine car. So yes, they do give you good fuel economy, but they're lousy for the year. In fact, as the diesels age, they say that they're more likely to put out four times more NOx and 22 to 100 times more particulate matters. So their diesels are kind of a disaster for a particular matter. And certainly the large trucks are, uh, the big diesel engines are not good. Uh, quick note on lead. Uh, 
we know we don't want lead in the, the human bloodstream. And during the, between the 76 and 80, the uh, level of lead in the human blood was up to 15 micrograms per dec deciliters. And of course they banned the uh, leaded gasoline and uh, dropped uh, the level dramatically. So this is one of the best things we've ever done is getting lead out of gasoline. And uh, they also did a study in Cincinnati and found that for each five microgram per deciliter increase in bloodstream lead, uh, there was a 50% increase in violent crime. So uh, somebody says get the lead out, it means a couple things. It means uh, to move it, but it also means uh, reduce your susceptibility mm -hmm. for uh, bad behavior. There are more and more studies showing correlations between uh, Ron pollutants and that references to two parts of the body: the brain and the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, we've got about nine minutes left. If you want to leave some time for a discussion, yeah, let's do. Uh, in, in Colorado, we have oil and gas operations and smelters. Smelters are really bad. Uh, metal smelters, cement kilns, even dry cleaning operations, petroleum refineries. And uh, we'll finish with just this last couple slides. Three, three more to go here. Generally, the numbers are coming down for a lot of the pollutants. You can see this is from 1990 to the present. And we've seen a lot of numbers coming down. What's not been coming down is the, uh, the ozone eight hour and the uh, particular matter. Now <laughs> some have politically said we're making progress on pollution and we are, but we're not getting the ozone and the PM down like we should. In fact, if we blow up part of this graph, and we go to 2016, we can see uh, with the Trump administration attack on the EPA, the numbers are turning back up, particularly for ozone, PM25, uh, and what's the orange color? I'll have to look at what that is. But political rules and laws do, make, do have an effect. Okay, we'll wrap it up with this one. Uh, you can look at some of the monitoring stations. What you see in blue there is the ozone non-attainment area for Colorado. That means that if you're living in that blue belt, you're not in a, uh, an area that meets the ozone concentration recommendation. So yeah, it does extend somewhat south. But of course, it's not linear either, and it, it does vary from point to point. But I encourage you all uh, to uh, use that website and, and, ch and check your air. Okay, here's the final slide. Uh, there's an argument going on right now about the effect of the oil and gas industry. Uh, particularly, oil and gas operations are allowed to start up uh, their operation and do the drilling and set up and all that. And they basically don't have to report for the first three months as they're doing their setup and startup. And they think that an awful lot of pollution is, is coming into the air during the drilling and startup and the setup. Uh, one oil company said uh, there's been a dramatic decline in ambient levels of oil and gas related VOCs. But a guy named Helmig uh, has reviewed 50 studies and said the peer reviewed literature very strongly points to a very significant contribution of oil and gas emissions to elevated ozone conditions in the state. So this is an active argument going on right now. And we didn't touch greenhouse gases today, but this shows the big uh, greenhouse gas, uh, the top 10 in the state. And they're all, the top 10 are all power plants. And again, we didn't touch that today. So I've talked too much. Uh, questions, comments? Ron, do yeah. uh, masks protect us from any of these uh, 
uh, airborne pollutants? Absolutely. Um, mask will help knock out a lot of the particulate matter, but they won't, they certainly won't capture uh, ozone or sulfur dioxide. They don't stop the gaseous molecules unless you wear a mask that has uh, carbon filters on it. And that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but just putting a, a, a wetted handkerchief across your face <laughs> will knock down a lot of the particulate matter and it helps you some more. But it won't, but it won't stop any of the gaseous particles. Thank you. Unless you have a carbon filter or some kind of a absorbent a reactive chemical agent in your mask. Hey, Ron, sometime we could do a class on, uh, it occurred to me, indoor pollution too. We could do an hour on that. Yeah. Radon, carpet, new carpet emissions, stuff like that. Um, and Vicki yeah. and I have been thinking lately about when you open the door to let fresh air in or a window, then you got all of the allergens coming in too from the grasses and the weeds and things. And so how do you find the balance of that kind of thing? <laughs> Certainly. Uh, Which is the worst thing. <laughs> You don't want to lock up a new house real tight uh, because uh, yep. all the uh, varnished wood and, uh, and paints are drying and releasing uh, outgassing. Uh, as the house gets older, there'll be less outgassing, but yeah, it's good to get some fresh air in. But you're right, fresh air also brings in. Uh, as we get older, more of us are also uh, allergic to things outside. And so you got to be careful of that too. Yeah. Hey, this is Jim Vandermeller, and I don't know whether other people have noticed uh, the background behind Jim Watson that he put on his on his screen, but uh, that picture uh, is one of the most dramatic pictures that has come back uh, from the space exploration, showing the relative depth of the of the atmosphere and the biosphere uh, along Earth and that in relationship to the Earth, uh, to the mass of the Earth, that it's a, just a little bit wider than a pencil line. Uh, and that how fragile this is and how precious this is and how we are so cavalier about uh, messing around with it. Uh, and if you just take a look at at Jim, at the background behind Jim right now, you will notice that um, uh, we have a real problem or that we could have a real problem if we damage this very fragile piece of jewelry around us. I uh, have a bit of personal information. We live in a complex of uh, several hundred departments and they did a survey on radon gas and we were one of the two apartments in the complex where the level was high enough that uh, I guess, I don't know if it's a law or their own uh, policy, but anyway, they uh, put an abatement, radon abatement system in, in these two apartments. So we have um, outside air flowing in all the time. 24-7. 24-7 and, you know, and exhausting the air in the apartment 24-7. Uh, so we have, in the wintertime, we have a competing cold air coming in and the furnace producing warm air and it makes kind of for a cold floor. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they say they, you know, uh, solved the problem. Well, any amount of radon gas is not good. It can cause uh, lung cancer, but, uh, you know, at our age, we're, we're not worried about Ron <laughs> uh, Dawson, uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much. A, a tremendous command of so much information for all of us. To the political, the Paris Accord, uh, certainly, so many, many think uh, the greatest existential threat to our planet is what you have been talking about. Do you wish to go beyond the Paris Accord at this point, or uh, any thoughts as you close? I'm sorry, I missed your. Do I? The Paris Accord. Uh, oh, the Paris Accords. Yes, okay. and beyond, because the greatest 
existential threat to the planet, as many people think today. Um, okay. I am preparing a lesson, and Steve's going to give me a date, for the very near future. And it's going to be called The War on the EPA. And it'll, it will be looking at what we've done in the last four years. We've uh, diminished or wiped out at least 60 environmental regulations, some of them uh, critically important ones. Uh, and we're going to be doing a lesson on that very subject. You know, the other thing that I would like to comment on is the relationship of all of the data and all of the studies that we're doing uh, towards uh, the economy and, and how well we are able to um, uh, make, a, make money, et cetera. Uh, but this last couple of months has kind of pointed out the fact that there are things that are more important than uh, just uh, producing uh, revenue. Uh, and I know there's an awful lot of people that are really scared to death because they want to go back to work. But we have literally shut down almost everything because we got our priorities straight for a change. Mm -hmm. And we decided that we would uh, put life ahead of money. We all, when we look at, when we look at all of the data that we're looking at, it's all designed for human existence. And there's an awful lot of species that are not surviving because of our existence. Uh, and if the National Geographic magazine, I think it was one or two issues ago, had a whole, uh, the front cover was all covered um, with pictures of bugs. Uh, and none of, it, none of us are really happy about having bugs crawl all over us. But these bugs are in grave danger. And the point of the article is that if these bugs cease to exist, that we're going to be, as a species, we're going to be in big trouble. And then when we start turning our backs on other species and, and exploiting the world for our benefit, that it comes home to Ruth, that, that it comes home to Ruth, much like uh, uh, Rev. Mark's sermon this morning, that we're all tied together. It's mm -hmm. a good point, Jim. I, I like the idea we have to think about that balance of uh, business and the environment because we got to have business, but it does hurt the environment. Hey, we're a couple minutes past 1130. Ron, do you mind if we start to wrap up? Yeah. We got all the slides, so not talk too much, but. <laughs> Very good. Well, how about any final comments or questions? <laughs> Again, never hear uh, tired of hearing Ron talk about things that he's knowledgeable about. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Very and good. Again, <laughs> go to this website to see and uh, check it out. It's it's really intriguing. Thank you. Uh, next week, uh, Thank you, Ron. Ron has invited uh, for us, and we're going to have as guest uh, an economist that advises the state legislature. Okay. Yeah, we have a gentleman by the name of Chris Stifler. This will be the third time he's spoken to our class. I don't know if anybody remembers, he brought in some uh, tangerines. We tossed them around and uh, mm -hmm. brought in the Purple Book of Colorado yeah. Finances. I remember that. Yeah, good guy. He's going to tell us about the impact of uh, everything that's been going on with the virus shutdown on the state especially. Oh, economy so should be timely thanks everybody for joining us we will see thank you, you Ron. Next thank you thank you bye everybody thank you goodbye bye 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 thank you ron okay another good one mm -hmm.